right, today we're talking about chapter six in our book. It's uh, a little bit different in a lot of ways. It's it's uh, how about it, it, it? It's not exactly developmental per se. It's an understanding of cognition in general. So in some ways, it's a summarization of an entire cognitive psychology course, sort of, kind of. But it's uh, it's uh, suffice it to say, it's information which is very useful and necessary for an understanding of how children think and how they're going to be performing. Um, it'll it'll help us to understand the kids a little more, but it's just a little bit different from a traditional developmental. Uh, developmental chapter. That's all right. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. So we're talking about information processing and cognitive development. Information processing is sort of like a uh, generic term to refer to memory, sort of, kind of, not quite exactly, because it also includes things like attention and things like that. But uh, the information processing approach is a theoretical approach focusing on how children perceive well, how people, but for this class, children, right? How children perceive, store, and retrieve information and on the strategies they use to solve problems. And yeah, problem solving, good stuff. Um, it comes from uh, computer science and uh, uses uh, computer as an analogy for how um, human, human information processing system works. There's a computer metaphor in which um, we refer to, you know, the... Um, the the uh, what am I trying to say? The, the RAM is the act part that's used at the moment. And, I mean, all the different whatever. I don't really want to get into it. Suffice it to say, um, this is an exam question right here. In this metaphor, in this uh, information processing metaphor or the computer metaphor, the CPU corresponds to the brain. Okay. Um, humans are limited. Okay, whatever. Yeah, we're limited in our capacity. Let's let's go on. Okay. It, there, oh, there's a whole information of processing. I don't know, whatever. Read it. Is it funny? No, I love it. Ha ha, go on. Okay. This is important. This is a good one, though. Processing capacity. Children are limited in their ability. So here is the number of digits recalled. I like this. This is to say, you ask a two-year-old to remember some numbers, and the average two-year-old remembers a little over two numbers. The average five-year-old can remember four of them. The average seven-year-old can remember five of them. The average nine-year-old can remember six of them. The average twelve-year-old and the average young adult. Okay, it's about seven. So clearly, we find that as we get older, our ability to our processing capacity, our total amount, goes up. The amount of information a person can remember or think about at one time. Okay, older children are able to process more information and process it faster than can younger children. Older children can think about two or more aspects of a problem at the same time. That's what processing capacity is all about, being able to multitask. Okay? Some people believe, though, that this processing capacity doesn't actually rise with age. It's something that is, in fact, constant. But what happens is that uh, children become more efficient at processing. And this is really kind of neat. It refers to the speed and accuracy with which children can process information. Uh, it, it, there's all of these things, but I'll give you a, a good example here. And in fact, here, let me define automaticity right here first. The ability to carry out a process with little or no conscious effort, leaving more cognitive capacity to carry out other tasks. Okay? Older children have more stored space simply because things become automatic. Let me describe this for you. Um, say, for example, um, Okay, in fact, this is, this is a, a, a very nice example. My daughter, she's eight years old. We've been working on her math. You know how that works. And um, as of now, she is pretty good at, like I said, I think I said this one yesterday, but she's pretty good at uh, multipl uh, multiplication. What, seven times eight, baby? And she's like, oh, oh, 56. All right, sweet. Two years ago, nothing. Wouldn't have worked. Okay. Now, what's going to happen? I'm going to make her go through flashcards over and over and over and over and over. Boy, she didn't hate them flashcards. My son hated them when he had to do this, but boy, it works. I need to make the process of 8 times 7 automatic, literally, to rewire her brain so that there is an association between when I see 7 times 8, I say 56, and it needs to happen automatically. By doing so, by making this automaticity, we find now that my son, who's doing algebra, 
just as a small portion of the problem. The problem per se is not 8 times 7. The problem is much, much, much larger than that. And there are many, many steps involved. One of those steps is 7 times 8. The fact that my son can now do 7 times 8 automatically, it is hardwired, his brain has been wired to hold that fact, makes it such that he's able to deal with a larger piece of information. His processing efficiency has increased. It is not the storage space per se. It's not like he can do, he just is able to do it more efficiently. Okay? Attention, however, is the ability to focus on a particular stimulus without becoming distracted by other stimuli. Suffice to say, um, we're going to be talking about memory in, in a good bit here. It's, it, 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 it'll be memory. It'll be talking about memory. But the first step in memory is always attention. Because uh, it, without atten attention, nothing enters the cognitive system, right? Nothing comes in without attention. So attention is the ability to focus on a particular stimulus without becoming distracted by other stimuli. Changes uh, over time as children learn to inhibit responses. It's actually a pretty tricky thing because um, the ability to focus your attention is in fact related to the ability to exhibit self-control. Because what happens is that um, it, you need to, in order to effectively use attention, you need to be able to um, inhibit your initial desires. That is to say, um, a kid is in a classroom and needs to pay attention to the teacher, but has an impulse to um, look at the pictures inside of their book or something. And they have to inhibit those things in order to attend to what needs to be. So attention is, is strongly related to this uh, inhibiting your initial responses. ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, is a disorder of attention. Um, it's characterized by restlessness or an inability to say, sustain attention. Excessive levels of activity that far exceed age appropriate norm. And deficient impulse control. Um, and this, this makes a lot of sense. The children that exhibit attention deficit hyperactivity disorder are very, very um, troublesome. Teachers, you better, you better work this one out. This is something that you better be thinking about on your own because um, I've taught my share of Sunday school. I've, I've never taught, you know, a classroom like like uh, children like that. But I, I have definitely taught Sunday school classrooms, and I can tell you from experience: you got 20 people in your room, and you got one kid that just won't sit down. Very quickly, the other 19 in that room are just going to totally misbehave. That one misbehaving kid will ruin your entire class. Okay. Now, what's up with this? This is a problem. You know. Um, it's not my fault. I have a disorder. Really? Just sit your it's in the chair. But I have a disorder. It's not my fault. Yeah, but you're ruining the class for the other 19 kids. All right? My ability to be a teacher has been destroyed by this one kid. So isn't it tempting to say, get him out of my class so that I can actually teach the other 19 kids? It's very tempting. Okay? And this is a, a real controversy that teachers now, you need to be aware of. Because there is a huge temptation for you guys to get rid of that kid. Because that kid truly is destroying your ability to be an effective teacher. Truly is. Why should the education of 19 children suffer? Because that one kid. So one kid is getting a half an education at best. The other 19 are all suffering. If you could just get that one out. Mm, man, oh man, that's a controversy. Okay, so anyway, it's, and then of course the controversy gets stronger, by the way, is when these teachers go to the parents of these kids and say, put your kids on meds or get them out of our school. Yeah, yeah, that, that's controversy. All right, parents tend to notice signs of hyperactivity three or four years of age. Uh, here's another little hint for you. Um, parents are blind. Parents are blind and stupid, including myself. My babies are angels, although I think they really are. But anyway, my babies are angels. They can do no wrong, okay? Anybody that hints or implies that my children are less than perfect, man, you just made yourself an enemy, right? And all parents are like this. So parents are not the best judges of this type of thing, okay? 
By age five to seven, children with ADHD begin showing signs of inattentiveness, usually in school. And only four to six percent of children meet a clinical criteria. Okay, four to six percent. That is um, just like with any uh, disorders. What happens is it's almost it's almost never a case of yes or no. I think we talked about this in some way. So it's not a matter of yes or no. Yes, you have ADHD, and no, you do not. Yeah, we did this one in fact when we talked about the um, fetal alcohol syndrome. Uh, instead, it's a matter of degree. This kid is exhibiting these symptoms. All right, he's a troublemaker, but he doesn't cross the line over into that area there where he's got this label. So we say four to six to meet the clinical criteria. The clinical criteria is just that, literally that way of saying, here's a point on the line, four to six percent fall on that side of the line and, and get labeled. There's lots of kids that are close to that line causing trouble. Uh, okay, so now memory. Talked about attention. So now, no matter what your capacity for processing new information, and no matter how efficiently you focus your attention, it will do you very little good unless you can store the information and then remember it later. Okay, that makes a lot of sense, right? Doesn't matter how big you are, doesn't matter how much laser focus, if it doesn't stick. Memory, by definition, is any evidence that something learned has been retained. We study memory, I mean, we, we test memory all the time. I mean, I'm going to test memory when you take your exams, right? You take my exam, and you need to recognize the correct answers. That's what, that's what multiple choice is all about, okay? During your essay portion, assuming you don't look into your notes when you're doing your exam, because that's what you sign in your behavioral contract, on the essay portion, you'll be forced to recall the information and pull it back out. But at the same time, memory can also be shown in things such as relearning. That is, um, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Like, I had to learn all of the state capitals when I was in fifth grade, and I had them all, bang, boom, okay? But of course, things happen over the years, whatever. My kids have to learn the state capitals, so of course now I'm exposed to it. It's pretty quick. I could pick it back up again pretty quick. Even though I was a little bit challenged. Delaware, Dover, Hook, got it. All right, so pick them all back up. Also, though, things such as emotional reactions. Uh, did, we talked about Little Albert, right? And freaked out by Santa Claus. Yeah. Little Albert's freaked out by Santa Claus is an evidence of a memory. Um, uh, well, okay, here we go. Uh, the storage model views information, the storage model of memory, views information as moving through a series of storage locations. Um, suffice it to say, I mean, this, this, this textbook is presenting things a little differently than I've seen in most places, but, you know, it, it's not different per se, it's just presented different, so it feels weird to me. Um, but anyway, suffice it to say, out in the world there's all kinds of information coming in, and it comes in through our, um, like our eyes or our ears, and it comes in for a very short amount of time. And for a very short amount of time, we have the ability to capture any piece of this information from the world. Any piece. And there's thousands and millions of pieces of information floating out there. But the majority of the information that comes into this memory system actually disappears, right? Because we can't possibly pay attention to everything. Those things that we pay attention to often move into the system into what we call the short-term store. The short-term store, in, in a couple of slides up, I'm going to refer to something called working memory, and it's very, very similar to this idea. A short-term store, a, the one that you have at the moment to work with, that you're actually doing a job with. Of this stuff, most of it, again, disappears. Okay, But some of it, in fact, moves into what's called the long-term store. Again, I... I, I the, in other places, it's sensory memory, short-term memory, long-term memory, right? Whatever, okay? And so it's limited in capacity, and most of it goes away, but some of it does, in fact, go into long-term storage. Information in the long-term storage is kind of useless, right? It's like, um, it's like saying, um, I have my dissertation, and it's stored on my hard drive, but I don't remember where it is. It's like, okay, it's in there, but... It doesn't do you any good as long as it's on your hard drive, right? It's only good when you actually get it up on your screen or print it out. Gotcha? 
That's what it's like. I shaved it. It's in there, but it's junk. I really need to be able to bring it back here for it to be any good at all, okay? To be useful. And so that's an interesting interesting model. It's a little different, but there it is. Um, all right, here's some more. It's a short-term store. It contains the information that you are consciously aware of at the moment. The long-term store has this infinite capacity, uh, etc. Okay, whatever. The network model is very cool. Um, I like the network model. This is a little bit different. It, it uh, refers to, let me see here. Yeah, here. It refers to connections. And in fact, I like this because it goes back to the Piaget's notion of um, schemes. Scheme. True knowledge comes uh, from, uh, remember we, we talked about equilibrium, disequilibrium. We talk about a uh, sophisticated, sophisticated schemes, I don't know, whatever, sophisticated schemes which incorporate lots of information, but true knowledge really comes from an understanding of how the schemes work together, right? We had said it's a very, very simple notion. It's not knowledge of chairs and knowledge of tables that makes us smart. It's knowledge of how chairs interact with tables that makes us smart, right? It's the interaction of the schemes, not the schemes themselves, that truly make knowledge. Now, when we say interaction between the schemes, that's kind of what I'm talking about with the network model. These interactions, how table and chair work together. Not just how tables work and not just how chairs work. Important, yes, very important. But knowledge is how they work together. And that's what this network is all about. The network cons consists of concept nodes, which are basically the schemes, connected by links, how the schemes work together. Okay? Information can be activated to different degrees at any moment, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Let's take a, a look at a picture of a um, network model. Here is a network model of skateboarding. Okay? Let's say this is some scheme for skateboarding. I don't know what the hell skateboarding is. And so what happens is it's associated with other schemes, like a scheme for deck. I don't know what deck. I guess deck is a part you put your feet on. And the deck is associated with the wheels. And the wheels are a deck is associated with the bearings, etc. And then the uh, skateboarding is also associated with the schema for video games. Apparently there's video games about skateboarding. And the schema for video games. Now, assumingly, this schema for video games, I'm going to try a new trick. I just found this one. Ha! Ah, the schema for video games will also be connected to other schemes here. Oh, man. Other schemes over here. Say, for example, about um, Wii. Whoa. I'm trying to write with this thing. Wii. Right? So, assumingly, there are many, 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 many other concepts out there, including this one for the Wii, which is also connected into this network. Okay? Now, since I'm talking about skateboarding, I'm not going to connect it in there, but it is connected to this video game one. And so, this is what knowledge is really about, is this, this uh, these are all schemes. Every, each and every one of these is schemes. This, they are connected in this intimate way, and you see that, say, for example, the uh, in, in this particular example anyway, the thickness of the line, the thickness of the line represents how strong the connection is between them. And this is interesting because this is sort of like um, this this is neuro um, how do I say it? Let's say, for example, um, when I see a skateboard, this is the part of my brain that fires. Skateboard, skateboard, skateboard. When I see a video game, this is the area that goes video game, video game, video game. And these two are connected. I mean, all the neurons in your brain have a connection to each other to some degree or another. Some, I mean, some neurons are literally connected to each other, right? Some are more separated. Some have more connections. Some have fewer connections. Some the connection is a long circuitous route, okay? And so we find that the, the connection between skateboarding and bad biffs, I don't know what the hell that is, is kind of obscure and far. Okay? The connection between skateboarding and no slide is somewhat far off. In order to get there, it must activate this much more complex network. Okay? So we find that this model, 
is so, in many ways a model which is representative of the neural connections in our brains and how strong they are and how di distant they are. It's really a neat way to do it, and it, it, it's a different way to, to really understand memory. Uh, working memory, as we, we sort of hinted already, information that is currently active in the mental system and available at the moment. I mean, this is the stuff that is actually useful, right? The stuff that you can actually do something with. Similar to the short-term store, the stores model, uh, it uses it, something. Whatever, I, I don't necessarily see a difference between them, never have. Uh, working memory has a limited capacity of about 30, well, uh, and it decays pretty rapidly, about 30 seconds. Uh, again, I'm, I'm having a hard time because if this was cognitive class, it would be a whole lecture here, and I'm just trying to give you the knowledge you need for this course without um, taking it too far, okay? Working memory decays pretty rapidly, about 30 seconds. Uh, can, you're able to use about five to nine things. That is to say, you're allowed to have about five to nine things in it at any given time. However, uh, the question of what is these things, like you can have five to nine random digits in your head. Okay? Three, seven, four, six, five, four, hi, hoo, ha, how many, like seven in a telephone number. Okay? But at the same time, these could be chunks. Like I could have uh, five to nine dates in my head. 1942, 1987, 1994, okay? And so all of a sudden I have many, many, many more numbers, but I have the same five to nine pieces of information. How big are these pieces of information? Well, that's up to you, okay? And that's another thing that... Um, Another thing that children are able to do to, to better as they get older, going back to that last one, children just process more efficiently. Yeah, right here, okay? They learn better how to make larger, they, they have the same limitations, five to nine items, but they chunk them together in such a way that they can maximize what that five to nine items really is. Um, we can keep things active in, in working memory, of course, by um, rehearsing it. You know, the old grab, I know, it's we're all on cell phones now, but if you can remember way back when we actually used to use a telephone book and the telephone was on the wall, yeah, I know, 1902, right? Uh, so you go over to your telephone book, you look it up, 8675309, I got to call Jenny and that's her number, 8675309. In fact, I found the number on the bathroom wall. And now I got to get over to the to the phone out there. Eight six seven five three zero nine. Jenny, I got your number. Eight six seven five three zero nine. I'm gonna rehearse that bad boy. Eight six seven five three zero nine. And I'm gonna say it over and over and over. And as long as I keep rehearsing it, I can keep it in my working memory, and I can still remember Jenny's number all the way over to the payphone when I want to give her a call. All right. And by the way, those of you that was a cultural reference. If you were born anywhere after 1975, you will not know that cultural reference. That's all right. Uh, yeah, the higher the working memory performance, the higher the child's cognitive ability scores. Not a shock at all. Um, we talked about long-term memory. Like we said, that's an, it's useless. It just it, I mean, it's a hugely important to have it. But it's kind of useless per se because um, it's just like having something on your computer but not actually having it on your screen. We can talk about stages of processing. Encoding, storage, and retrieval are the three main stages. Encoding, storage, and retrieval are the three main processes describing the memory process. Um, we encode information to bring the information into our memory systems. It needs to be stored in our memory systems so that it doesn't, you know, so that it can be used later on. And used later on, it must be retrieved out of the long-term memory into the working memory in order to be useful. And these three steps, and again, this is like three weeks right here. I've got three weeks of cognitive class right there. Uh, problems can occur at any stage here. On its way in, doing coding while it's in storage or while you're retrieving it, we can have issues. This is a very good one. Other characteristics of memory development, something called reconstructive memory. 
In fact, before I do, I want, I want to make sure I remember my kid gave one to me this morning. It was actually pretty good. Um, we had a discussion about, uh, I was on the radio, I was on a radio program a bunch of years ago, and um, I asked my son this morning, do, do you remember that? And he says, no, well, no, yeah, I do, I do, because mom told me about it last week. That's his memory. His memory is, his memory of the event is not his memory of the event, but his memory of the event is what mom told him about that event. Okay, and that's what I'm going to kind of talk about here is that memory is kind of funky. In fact, I'll give you a little, uh, here's another one I spent another two weeks on and I'm going to do it in two minutes. Uh, many people, here's, here's a little analogy for how memory would work, okay? Memory is like a safety deposit box. You simply put your memory into the safety deposit box and you come back in two weeks and you retrieve it and there it is, okay? Or um, perhaps memory is like a videotape. Um, let's say if I wanted to retrieve the memory of my son's first steps, I would simply have to go home, find the video on which his first steps occur, uh, put it into the machine, run it, and then I would have a 100% accurate recording. So a lot of people believe that these are good analogies, that memory is like a videotape. It's been... It's been recorded, it's been stored. Sometimes we have a hard time, let's say, for example, because I can't find exactly which disk it's on or, uh, you know, something like that. But it doesn't work like that. We, we don't catch that. We construct memories. We, we build them from weird shit like mom told me about, okay? We use this to build our memory systems. It's not like a video tag. Reconstructive memory refers to the idea the memory only stores some aspects. It only stores some aspects. When we, we try to recall information, we piece it together, and then we make inferences about the rest. Well, what I would have thought at that time was, not what I thought at that time, what if I was in that situation, this is how I must have felt. That's the kind of memory construction that we do. Memory can be affected by what we know and how we are asked to retrieve it. Uh, here is an interesting example. And children, by the way, are, are <clears throat> even worse at this than adults are, but um, adults are, are very troublesome. This is a classic study. They took this, um, they, they, they videotaped an automobile accident. Okay, here's some accident. And uh, they showed this to 100 people. Okay, they showed the videotape. So all 100 people saw the same video. And then they took half of them and they asked them this simple question. They said, how, how fast were the cars driving when they hit each other? And people are like, I don't know, 30 miles an hour. The other half of the people, they said, how fast were the cars driving when they smashed into each other? And all of a sudden, this word smashed was very influential. It made for some inferences, right? This inferences. Remember, both groups, all they're literally doing is sort of trying to pull out an image of that videotaped accident and replay it and pull, ding, okay? Well, and then you say hit. It's a, like 30 miles an hour. When you say smash, you're like 45 miles an hour. Funky. Now that's a memory construction, okay? That's what re reconstructive memory is about. But this gets even better because they now said, okay, thank you much, go on home. And then they bring them back in a month. They say, okay, now I want you to remember back. You remember that videotape you watched? Was there glass at the accident site? And people are like, let me think about that. And those people that you had asked that question, how fast were they hit? Well, you know, how fast were they ever they hit each other? And they had said 30 miles an hour. And now all of a sudden they incorporated their, their response, 30 miles an hour, into their own memory. And you ask them about the glass and they're like, no, I don't think so. Because in their memory, that's a fender bender in a neighborhood. That other group that was 45 miles an hour, you know, or was smashed and they said 45, they're like, mm, yeah, there was, there was glass there. Why? Because 45 is a much more violent accident, and their entire memory structure now has been reconstructed around this this piece of information that you then planted and influenced into them. Pretty cool stuff. That's how memory works. It is not like a videotape or a, a safety deposit box or something. Okay, it just doesn't work like that. Infantile amnesia is the lack of memory for very early experiences. Um, and this is kind of funky because when a kid is young, 
they have pretty damn good memory, all right? They remember when you promised them something. Trust me on that. Do not promise a kid a cookie unless you're willing to give them a cookie, all right? They will call your bluff. Um, but what happens now is, my like my kids, my, my daughter's eight. She doesn't remember anything about when she's three or younger. Nothing. There's nothing. There's zero memories. And even at four or five, they're very vague at best, okay? Uh, but at that time, they were quite good. Don't get me wrong, okay? So why does this occur? Um, maybe the brain is immature. Um, storage def deficit based on a lack of an organi organizing framework. I think this is uh, perhaps the most important because, again, pulling out our Piaget, um, true knowledge or wisdom perhaps comes from an understanding of how these schemes interact with each other. Right? That's that's true wisdom. That's true knowledge, and um, it's something that builds slowly. I mean, by definition, you cannot be young and be wise. Right? You just can't be. And so what happens is you get older and get a more and more sophisticated understanding of how these schemes interact with each other. It allows us to understand the world better and it allows us to put memories in place. It allows us to have a uh, framework to put them into, to fit into. Otherwise, I mean, like, I'm going to ask you to memorize, you know, nine foreign words and I'm not going to tell you what they mean. And you're like, oh. Okay, I mean, it's just random information if you don't have a storage structure to put it into, right? So that's what it's about. Without a storage structure, without a, a framework to fit it into, it's just random bits of information. Okay? Autobiographical memory is a specific type of uh, memory that includes information about events that have a high level of personal significance. Yeah, autobiographical memories are kind of amazingly cool, um, very detailed, very vivid, um, and uh, and they, they're much better for, than memories of other people, by the way. Uh, I don't know why they're even putting it in here, but there it is. Uh, this is kind of cool. This is, um, I, sort of so, I sort of said this when I was talking about the storage model. Suffice it to say, there's thousands of millions of pieces of information getting hitting us at any given moment you know I mean the, the, the sounds coming from the projector the lights from each different angle the shadows uh, the colors the dots the screens uh, I just millions of pieces of information and any one of those pieces of information has the potential to move into my memory system they all have the potential but I couldn't ever possibly bring them all in because my brain is limited. We've said that repeatedly. I've got a limited capacity coming in here. So the majority of the information never enters my system. It just sort of fades away. But some of it enters my short-term memory, that, that short capacity stuff, the stuff that fades at 30 seconds maximum if you don't rehearse it, things like that. Of that, again, by far the majority of that information fizzles away. It doesn't actually get put into storage. And then even when it's in storage, okay, if you, some, you know how, let's say, for example, the tip of the tongue, you're like, I know that answer, but, uh, uh, and if you can't retrieve it, it's as good as gone. Whether it's there or not is irrelevant. It's as good as gone. So the, the idea is this concept of forgetting is occurring as it enters into the system all the way down. Uh, knowledge base, the, inf the information a person knows about a particular topic. Yeah, this is, this is interesting. This is tricky. I, um, I'm torn. I'm torn. You know, I, I think that, you know, um, in some ways, knowledge of state capitals is idiotic, right? I mean, what possible purpose does that serve? If I really want to know the capital of Vermont, by the way, it's Montpelier. But if I really wanted to know, oh, man, I just got this phone, so I got to. Siri, what is the capital of Vermont? Let me think. I found this for you. Uh, is that Montpelier, Vermont? City population 7,855 people. Urban area 22,000. Holy crap. It sucked to live in Vermont. The metro area 59,000, etc. 
So Siri can pull all that out just like that. All right. And if Siri knows, all right, what 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 purpose does it serve me to know the capital of Vermont? All right, it serves me no purpose at all. Yet at the same time, it is this knowledge base which is required for a sophisticated understanding. Remember, we already said it. We're like. Uh, you got these schemes, all right, but it's not the, the schemes themselves that are now that are that are that are wisdom that are that are useful. Yet I can look those schemes up. Uh, you want to know about the scheme for an elephant? Everything there is to know about an elephant? Just ask Siri. She'll tell you about elephants. Okay. So how the hell is it useful to you? Because you have to have this knowledge base in order to form. Remember the network model. I love the network model. In order to have that network, which really was wisdom. In order to have that wisdom, that true knowledge, you have to have a knowledge base, don't you? You have to. So, it affects your ability to remember information. Okay, You can remember one thing better if you have more knowledge about other stuff around it. Uh, the more you know about a topic, the more you remember about it. That's for a fact. New information is integrated with old information. Retrieval becomes more efficient. Speed of processing also increases. Again, this is also helps to explain the infantile amnesia two slides back. Also, it turns out experts organize information differently than novices. Knowledge base is the most important factor in explaining why adults are better than children are most cognitive tasks. Because adults have more bits of information to pull from. Information, blah, 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 practice, etc. Okay, I, I want to show you, I want to think this one. They took uh, child chess experts, okay? And what they did was they took these child chess experts, and what they did was they put uh, 10 year old chess experts, and they put out pieces on a uh, chessboard, okay? And then they, they said, okay, I want you to remember as many of these pieces in their locations as you can. And check it out these little 10 year old kids remembered an average of nine and a half pieces, the adults could only remember six. But when it came to random digits, the 10-year-old kids could only remember six of them, and the adults could remember almost eight of them. Okay? So clearly, when you're an expert and you have an incredible knowledge base, look at what happens. But once you take away that advantage that this group of 10-year-olds had in this situation, that's what pops out. Okay? And that's a really cool finding. And by the way, there's an interesting side note. If you do the same study, but the chess pieces are on the board in a random fashion, these kids just don't do shit at all. They don't remember anything. This is only true if the pieces are placed on the board in a, a logical fashion that would be an actual chess match. Okay? That's where their advantage lies. Strategies. Conscious, intentional, and controlled uh, plans that people employ to improve performance. Um, strategies have an impact on rehearsal is a simple example. You repeat it over and over and over. Another strategy is chunking. We talked about chunking, putting it together. These strategies, remember at the beginning we said, older children um, have more processing capacity than younger children. And they're like, no, I don't think they really have more processing capacity. They're just more efficient. How are they more efficient? Boom. This is how they're more efficient. They know how to use these tricks. Here's a couple of other strategies. Organization. The strategy was we use our relationship among items to improve our memory for the items. Sounds like that whole scheme up. I'm going to tell you. Here's a, here's a hint. One. Ask me to remember 10 Pokemon characters. I'm going to fail miserably. Ask my son two years ago to memorize 10 Pokemon characters. He'd have all 10 memorized before you even said them. And he'd say, give me 50 more. All right? Because he would have different strategies. Trust me. He would organize those things in a way. He would be like, okay, I have four fire eaters and nine ice explorers. I don't know. I have none. I, I don't know about Pokemon. All right? But that, he'd have these things. All right? Um, another, another strategy would be elaboration, where we create visual or verbal associations. Okay? We could, of course, use mnemonic devices, you know, you know the old uh, Reggie Bibb to remember the rainbow colors or something. Younger children just don't use these strategies. They just don't. They don't. I mean, you can coach them. You can, you can coach them and you can improve their cognitive performance through coaching, but they don't do it naturally. 
Older children are much more likely to do this information, and strategies are more common once you're familiar with the information. Metacognition is the understanding or knowledge that people have about their own thought processes and memory. You know, the act of thinking about thinking. Number one, all of us, we suck at metacognition. We are terrible. We are the worst judges of our own performance. We don't know what the hell we're thinking. I know, it sounds really stupid. But uh, it's the old example, like, um, you know, people say, you know, I, I, and I'm totally guilty of this, too. I'm 100% guilty, so don't even. But it's like this, you know, people are like, there is no way that commercials influence me. Advertising doesn't influence me. It must influence other people, otherwise the advertisers wouldn't spend that money. But they're wasting their money sending that advertisement to me, all right? And I'm telling you, I can remember one case. I will admit it. I was... I was in college, and there was a commercial on television for steak, and it looked so good. I had to run out and buy me a steak. I'll admit it. I'll admit it. But other than that, I don't, I don't think advertising influences me. But you know what? Everybody else says the same thing. Advertising doesn't influence me. What must? Okay? Or it wouldn't be, they wouldn't be spending that kind of money on it. Okay? Uh, meta memory. A subcategory of metacognition is knowledge about the processes and contents of memory. Uh, meta memory and metacognition in many ways are reflections of wisdom. Meta memory applies to general knowledge as well as knowledge of specific memory abilities. Um, younger children tend to overestimate their memory abilities. Everybody overestimates their memory abilities. Okay, everybody does. Theory of mind. I love theory of mind. This is cool. In fact, we've sort of seen this idea earlier. We just didn't really formalize it. A good here is a good a good failure. Before I get into theory of mind, let me describe an opposite case. Remember the kid, the egocentric kid in PJ's Three Mountains task, and they're like, "Okay, there's a clown sitting right there across the table from you. Now I want you to tell me what is that clown seat." And then that little kid, remember the pre-operational kid, in fact says exactly what he himself is seeing is not able to put themselves in the place of that, that uh, clown and see what the clown is seeing. And that is exactly what a failure of theory of mind is all about. Though I'm going to simplify it when I say theory of mind is the ability to understand what other people are thinking. It's sort of true, a coherent and integrated understanding of what the mind is, how it works, and why it works that way. Um, children as young as three know that mental objects are different from real objects. Oh, they don't make uh, appearance reality distinctions, uh, whatever. Okay, so theory of mind is pretty cool. Um, language plays an important role in theory of mind because it allows us to talk to children about what I'm thinking or feeling, uh, what my emotions are, what my desires are. Uh, but again, we're all we're all guilty of, of of failures on theory of mind repeatedly across our lifetime. Um, it's related to the ability to engage successfully with other people in conversations. Um, it, it's really important for, especially for things such as empathy and other social relations. Um, theory of mind, if I had to pick it, I would say it comes out of the development of the mirror neuron system in the brain. The mirror neuron system in the brain is a special part of your brain which is activated and it's an area of your brain that is activated in similar ways. Um, let's say when um, I'm performing, in fact, let's say there's an area of your brain that's activated when you feel pain. Oh, God, that hurts. And there's a similar area of your brain that's activated when you watch a loved one feeling pain. Oh, my God, it's empathy. And so empathy is the feeling of pain that the other would feel or something like that. And so we find that this mirror neuron system, this part of our brain, which is somewhat unique to human beings, not, not really exactly, but something that we have quite well, um, gives us this ability to empathize, gives us the ability to have social interactions. This theory of mind is humongous. Without this theory of mind, um, I don't want to say you would be selfish. That's kind of, kind of, but no, that's not right. That's not right. Um, without the ability to demonstrate theory of mind, you would be autistic. Okay. In fact, children with autism, when it comes to that mirror neuron stuff, 
they have a very large they a failure. Uh, their their mirror neuron system doesn't fire in the same in the way non autistic children's brains do. You take an autistic child and you say, okay, now I want you to imitate this gesture, and then the, the kid mm -hmm, goes, huh, all right, and the foot. Why did you do that? Because you pointed your palm at that wall, so I pointed my palm at that wall. I was like. Dude, no, I pointed my palm at you, you know. And so they can't, they, they, they see it literally. They don't see it as, you know, they don't they don't have this ability to, they just don't see, uh, so or here, here's an example. There was this one family, I know they have two two boys that are autistic. And uh, one boy, or the older brother, uh, shoved the little brother down the stairs one day. And I was like, oh my God, is the kid mean? Is he evil? He's like, no. He just didn't view his brother as anything but an object that was in my way. You know, he didn't he didn't view his brother as being anything different than than a table or a chair. If you're walking and there's something in your way, you move it out of your way, right? I mean, it's just it's an object. You just move it. And so he didn't view his brother as somehow distinctly different or special in any way, as opposed to a table or a chair. It's just another object. Children with autism have great difficulty communicating and interacting with others in socially appropriate ways. Now, suffice it to say, children with autism literally need to be taught about emotions, okay? You have to teach them. Well, when somebody's lips are up like this, that means that they're in a good mood. They're like, oh, okay. I mean, you, you and I, we just intuitively do this stuff. We just, we don't, we don't stop and think about, oh, I mean, rarely, rarely. We don't stop and think about, okay, his eyes are up, therefore he's more likely to say yes to a favor. But a kid with autism has to be explicitly taught how emotions work. Okay, It's not intuitive to them. They just don't have the theory of mind. They don't have an, a, a mirror neuron system that's firing in the same way. They're often un, unable to understand other people's thoughts. They don't seem to have insight about their own thoughts. Um, and they may have deficits in the, uh, yeah, 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 in metacognition. Autism, however, just like, just like ADHD, just like fetal alcohol syndrome, it's a spectrum disorder, so it can take on forms from mild to severe. Um, you can have autistic-like symptoms and not be autistic. Um, in fact, there's a, a hypothesis out there now called the geek hypothesis. And the geek hypothesis is just like, you go back to your high school and you remember some of them kids that were freaks, man. You know the ones, right? And uh, it turns out that, you know what, they just were exhibiting symptoms. They weren't autistic per se because they didn't cross that line. But clearly they, they had symptoms of autistic symptoms and that's what made them into a geek. They just didn't cross that line to the point where they couldn't fit in anymore. Uh, kind of an interesting notion. Common behaviors of children with autism include repetitive body movements, uh, self-stimulation, inflexible routines, um, in delayed language skills, because language, by the way, is a huge social interaction, and they just don't understand the social components of it. Or, or uh, by the way, they not just that, but they, they have a hard time, because when we use language, there are many aspects of language which are implied. You know, you say, let's say, uh, I would go to the store if I had a car. You, you're you hinting at somebody, hey, give me a ride or something like that. Um, you can't hint like that. You can't use these implied forms with somebody with autism. They, they won't pick it up. They just won't pick up those implications like that. Autism affects about 35 out of every 100,000 children in the U.S., so I think that this number has been rising quite rapidly in recent years. Um, it's real controversial. Is autism on the rise, or is it just that we're paying attention now more and giving the label more often? I think it's some of each. Um, so what's causing it? Is it the, uh, the vaccines? <laughs> No, it's not the vaccine. Vaccinate your kids, all right? Don't be spreading those smallpox or any of that other bullshit because you're afraid. This is not causing autism, all right? Uh, but anyway, there's a strong genetic ties. It runs in the family. Um, I know that, uh, again, this family that I know, they have the two boys with autism, and uh, they covet my children, man. I... I 
I, I mean, that's a, such a biblical word to covet, but they do. They covet my children. And you can just see how much they wish they had children that weren't like this. But <clears throat> at the same time, they are so deathly afraid of having a third child because once you got two with autism, I mean, the cards are really stacked against you. There's something that, so that their, their, their biggest fear is that their third child would in fact also have autism. Um, the effect of this treatment depends on the severity of symptoms. It's many ways, like I said, behavioral disorder. Uh, autism is an interesting disorder because it's one of these disorders. In, in fact, it's really, it's, I find autism to be different than other mental disorders because um, a kid with autism doesn't know they have autism or if they do know they have autism, they really don't give a shit. All right. Autism is a disorder which is suffered by everybody else around them, much more so than by the kid that has it. Um, I watched a, a documentary one time called... Uh, it was called Autism is a World, and it was a very interesting documentary. It was this girl who uh, had autism, and uh, the parents assumed, okay, she's retarded, she's just, uh, whatever, you know, just assume the worst. And one day, they, this girl discovered a keyboard, all right, and she was able to type. And as soon as she was able to type, and then they hooked it up to a... Uh, communicator and she could say things and stuff and all of a sudden she was able to communicate with the world and she wasn't retarded okay and so what happens is she she goes through in this documentary and she tries to explain autism as an autistic person so it's not just an explanation of autism you know from a clinical perspective a child with autism behaves in this way and so this girl, I mean, I, I can't remember all the details, but here's one I do remember that was, was very interesting. She, um, when she get, would get upset, it, she would have to calm herself down. And the trick that she used to calm herself down was to hold a plastic spoon under running water. Okay? And she would hold it under the running water, and then she would calm down, and everything would be better. Okay? And so now we're looking at this from the outside, and we're like, what the hell is that? Why would that? That doesn't even make sense to me, right? And so they asked this girl, "Why? Why do you do that? Why do you? Why do you run this water over the spoon?" And the girl says, "I have no idea. It doesn't make any sense to me. I just know that it does." And so even this autistic girl was just like, "I just don't know. I have no idea. I just do." Okay. And it was really kind of a neat video, a neat uh, documentary. If you aren't planning on working with children with autism in any way, shape, or form, check this one out. It will really give you an insight into autism, not just from a clinical perspective. This is how they behave, but this is what they're thinking, okay? So check it out. It's really, really overlooked. I think it was an HBO documentary or Showtime. I don't remember. Uh, no. Um... Uh, do I care too much about here? Not really. This at this point. Oh, what am I here? Thirty-three. Okay, it's locked up. Isn't that lovely? Yeah, that's just what we want to have in our class. Uh, okay. Uh, we we sort of talked about this already, so I don't necessarily want to. Connectionist models, we sort of, I've already described this when I talked about the network model and put up the whole, how they're connected to each other. Um, connectionist models are very interesting because um, our knowledge of cognition is uh, important. But it's not just academic. We want to understand it so that we can uh, use it for something advantageous. In particular, let's say, for example, artificial intelligence. Tell me, okay, raise of hands, right? <laughs> raise of hands. Who wants to have the auto driving car? I do. Hell, I want to watch Netflix on my way to work, okay? I want to, in that 30 minutes that I'm driving, I'd rather be watching Netflix and catch up on some, some, some television show. So I want the auto driving car, okay? And who wants to have, you know, a, a, uh, oh, I love Siri, right? Siri's awesome. Who wants to have a Siri for your house, you know? Uh, yeah, Siri, I want you to go make me a cup of coffee, and uh, I want you to make it kind of strong and throw in a little bit of cream into it, and go. 
Who doesn't want that? I want that. Okay. And so what happens is we try to understand how memory systems work and all of the cognitive structures work so that we can map them out onto the computer. And it's really an interesting thing because um, I, in fact, did some of this work in when I was in um, Carnegie Mellon for my postdoc because uh, what happened was they, uh, I, was, I was studying decision making. And I was trying to make a computer model that would make decisions in the same way that human beings did. And it was really kind of complicated because human beings are irrational. And so how do you, you know, I mean, if, if, if human beings were perfectly rational, it'd be a it would just be a breeze to program it because it would just be like a set of rules. Just throw in some rules. Bing, ding. If A, then B. If B, then C. Then C, then D. Then uh, done. But unfortunately... Things, especially like human decision making, but all human cognitive things are inefficient and irrational. And yet, that's what you need to program into this computer is the irrationality. And it, it was a really a neat, a neat. It was a fun job, but I mean, I'm glad I loved it. Okay. And there's a roof, roof, ah, roof, roof. Okay, whatever. AI, I love it, the artificial intelligence branch, branch of computer science, and investigate the extent to which machines can simulate or duplicate the intelligent behavior of living organisms. All right, whatever. Um, it, it is very cool, but to define artificial intelligence is not an easy thing. I believe the next chapter we're going to talk about intelligence in humans, so here's a not a bad start, okay? What is intelligence in a, in a computer? Well, here is the definition of artificial intelligence. It's called the Turing test. It's really kind of cute. You got yourself a computer, and you you think that this computer is going to be smart. This is, a, this is a thinking computer. And so what happens is this human being sits at a terminal or something and feeds questions in. Okay? What is your name? And the questions go to both a human and to a computer. And they, they give answers. And this guy asks a bunch of questions, and they, they both give answers. If this guy here, at the end, is like, I have no idea which one is a human. I can't figure out which one's a human and which one's a computer. And if this human being cannot distinguish between which one is human and which is computer, then this is the demonstration of artificial intelligence. Okay? And there hasn't been a system yet that can pass a Turing test. Okay? It just, there was nothing yet. Human beings could tell the difference. Well, this is a neat little model. Um, I guess I, 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 I would argue that uh, there's two different, two different ways that people view artificial intelligence, weak and strong. Weak artificial intelligence is this notion that we might be able to program a computer to imitate human beings, but we would never be able to create true human thought. Okay? That's what this is, true human thought. This is an imitation of human thought. And so we find that um, weak artificial intelligence is a somewhat, is, is a reality that we are approaching. It's a reality we are approaching because it's simply a matter of creating a really complicated rule book. All right? Like I said, even with my decision-making stuff, though it was complicated because it was illogical, even the illogic had probabilities involved, had, you know... Um, this human being will make the rational decision 90% of the time, but 10% of the time there will be a random component sprinkled in. And so, you know, you, you by, 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 by taking the rules of logic and, th and peppering in a little bit of probability, you can imitate the way human beings behave. You can. It's, per it's pretty easy to do. All right? You can imitate human cognitive processes. Is it the same as actually having intelligence? No. However, if my goal is to make a Siri for my house or an artificial drive or a car that drives itself, that's all I need. I really don't need one because this, this would imply a computer that had creativity. This is one that can act like a human. Okay? If my goal is to have an, a, 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 a car that drives itself, that's what I need. If my goal is to create new knowledge, that's what I need. I don't want this because I still want to have a place in the world. I have a purpose. Um, the fuzzy trace theory suggests that memory representations go from very exact and literal to being imprecise, general, and fuzzy. That is to say, um, uh, my memory of an event 
starts out as almost a photograph. But as time passes, that image, that memory gets fuzzier and fuzzier. Okay? And so what happens is now 10 years, 10 years later, now you, it, uh, you say, oh, I, I want you to remember the events of September 11, 2001. And you'd be like, okay, now, if you would have asked me September 12, 2001, I'd have been pretty damn good, and I would have given it to you. Here, I have some memories. I can remember the vague details. I remember hearing some some people talking in the hallway, saying things that didn't really make sense, planes and crashing, and, and I don't, why do I give a shit about plane crashing? I don't understand. And something about Trade Center, and I don't, I don't know. You know, and I remember this, and I can remember looking out into the hallway, and people were gathered together around a television. The guy in the office across the hall had a television. Maybe my memory is funky. Maybe they were gathered around a computer, but my memory was he had no black and white television in there. I my memory is uh, I went back to my office and I plugged. Uh, we tried to get on to CNN.com, but it just wouldn't load. My memory was I called my wife and we had a discussion to decide it was probably best to go home. I mean, I got these, but the exact details are like gone. I'm sort of constructing it. I have a few, a few core components of that day, which are pretty strong in my memory. And I'm filling in the fine details. I'm reconstructing the fine details with what I would have done was, what probably happened was, and that's how I'm constructing my memory. There's a few core ideas and then filling in the fuzzy, the fuzziness in between. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so we are done with the uh, chapter six. Next time we will talk about intelligence and academic skills which is a very, very controversial one. We're going to get you because clearly one of the most important things in this thing is um, what is intelligence? Mm. It doesn't matter what you call it. It predicts who succeeds in life and who doesn't. Yeah, but what the hell is it? How do I know? But it predicts who wins and who loses. Yeah, but tell me what it is. I don't know. All right. I should stop now and we will move into chapter 7 in a while and I'll see you then.